Welcome to the show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alcena. For this segment of the show, I'm going to continue to talk about hypertension. When I left out last week, I was talking about the effect of hypertension on the brain. And I'll continue this discussion in this segment. Worldwide, there are 1.5 billion folks who suffer from hypertension. And every year, 7.5 million people across the world die because of hypertension. It's a very, very, very common problem. In this country, it is said by some statistics that 46,000 folks could be saved every year if blood pressure was controlled properly. Now, that's a major, major problem. There's 67, uh, 76,000 people in this country suffer from hypertension, and 67, that is 76 million, sorry, 76 million people suffer from hypertension. And in this country, some 67 million folks suffer from what's called uh, pre-hypertension, which may or may not exist, because one has to talk about it in context. Now, how do you go from hypertension with brain disease? Well, as I mentioned in the last couple of shows, when the blood pressure is elevated within the body, a result of that, the inside the arteries and uh, different calibers of arteries, arterial, etc. the pressure, of course, becomes elevated as well. And that elevated pressure inside arteries and different sizes of arterioles or whatever, that then affects the first lining inside a blood vessel, what we call the intima. Just the fact that the pressure is elevated inside it, because that's an unnatural situation. That then causes an abnormality to begin to develop in the role of the first lining of the, of the vessel. When, once that occurs, then as blood passes through, naturally blood carries all sorts of debris to get it out of the urine, etc., out of the stool, etc. Those, those debris, some of them get stuck inside a now no longer smooth part of this blood vessel. Then that traps some of this debris that's passing through and then one debris piled up out of another, you begin to develop plaque. The plaque then causes the vessel to become narrowed. When the vessel becomes narrowed, in this case we're talking about the brain, it cannot carry blood to that part of the brain where the vessels are effectively, therefore cannot carry oxygen either. And then that situation then can cause one to develop what's called microvascular disease of the brain, meaning multiple little plaques throughout the brain. When that develops, that predisposes an individual to develop a big stroke. You have to understand, every year in this country, some 700,000 people suffer from strokes. And every second of every minute in this country, somebody is having a stroke. Now, okay, so you have the stroke. There are different types of stroke. There's the so-called ischemic stroke. The ischemic stroke is when lack of oxygen to the part of the brain results in a stroke. Then you have the hemorrhagic stroke. The hemorrhagic stroke, which is whereby the pressure is so high inside the blood vessels, and the blood vessels is no longer as strong as they used to be because of the plaques that are inside them, so the tensile strength of the vessel now becomes abnormal, that then can cause the vessel to rupture. And the rupturing of the vessel can lead to what's called an acute hemorrhagic stroke, bleeding into the brain. Then there's a third form of stroke that can occur. That's the so-called embolic stroke. That is to say, something happened to the heart, the part of the heart they call the atrium. Something happened to the heart. The heart becomes abnormal. That then affects the atrium. The atrium is supposed to be contract like this all the time as the blood passes through it. Once the atrium becomes abnormal, it begins to fibrillate. Fibrillate. Now, if the atrium was fibrillating all the time, that's bad because it can cause a rapid rate of the heart that can create a problem. But that's not going to affect you if it's just fully breathing like this and then the ventricular rate is normal. That's, that's, nothing bad is going to happen to you. However, when the atrium is doing this, 
the blood inside it system becomes stagnant. The stagnation of the blood as it sits inside the atrium causes little clots to develop. And the little clot that develop because the inside the stagnant blood sits there. And every now and again, instead of the atrium continuing to do that, intermittently the atrium contracts. As the atrium is contracting, it shoots those little clots that were sitting there toward the brain, you develop an embolic stroke. There's all sorts of other ways you can have an embolic stroke having nothing to do with blood pressure. I'm fully aware of that. But I'm talking about blood pressure, in this case affecting the heart, which I'll be talking about next, that can cause that to happen. So now you have the three types, the most common types of stroke that develop. And all this as a result of blood pressure. Now you have to understand, blood pressure by itself is bad enough when you have a combination of blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes mellitus, and obesity, all these things can cause someone to have a stroke as well. And once, first of all, you cannot be obese and be healthy. Anybody tells you that you are obese and you're healthy is fooling you because you cannot be. You have to understand, according to the latest statistics, 40.2% adult women in this country are obese. 35% adult men in this country are obese. 17% children and adolescents in this country are obese. That is a massive epidemic, big time. And as it comes in, the statistics are coming out as, of, as late as yesterday in the literature. The poorer the individual, the more likely they're gonna suffer with more medical problems because they eat a poor diet that is too much, that has too much fat, too much salt, too much simple carbohydrate. In addition to that, they have tremendous amount of stress because of the poor economic situation. There are many reasons why people have stress. You could be as wealthy as you could be and still have stress for a variety of other reasons. But the segment of society that suffers the most from stress, of course, is those that are suffer from the most economic deprivation that create a situation where they're less educated, they're less likely to get a good job, and then, needless to say, they also suffer from major, major societal slash racial discrimination, which is another layer of constant every second single day stress. There are reasons why people have stress. They can become sick. Family member gets sick. They develop a disease. They get into an accident, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when individuals are not able to pay their bills, they can't pay their rent. All right, they can't eat proper food because they don't have the money to pay for high quality food. They're forced to eat all this fast food. Now, fast foods are fine so long as you eat it with moderation. But when you're eating it as your main way of eating, then you get yourself into trouble. The poorer the community, the more you have large numbers of shops and little restaurants that sell unhealthy food because that's how they make money. And some of these Unhealthy places, of course, are owned by super, super rich corporations as well. They dump them into the black community. I'm not naming anybody particular entity or brand of food because I don't want to say anything that might be construed to be negative about people's product. This is not my intention because this is the United States of America. This is a capitalistic situation, uh, community, and I'm a capitalist. Everybody have to make a living. As long as they're making a living legitimately, it is up to the consumer not to buy the product, and it's up to them to try to sell the product in order to make money. That's part of what we are. This is America, and I'm all for that, except that, unfortunately, the least educated the individual is, the more likely that individual is going to get sicker 
and frankly suffer more because of health issues and die earlier at a younger age. That's, that's it. That is, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. So while poverty is not something for somebody to be ashamed of because I, I was ex so poor that it would make you cry by just knowing if I were to describe to you what I went through. And so I know what poverty is. I know what hunger is because I suffered through it. A lot of the stuff that I talk about in the show, that is stuff that I experienced myself. That's why. In fact, part of the problem that I'm experiencing every day, seven days a week in my profession as a physician, because the medical community happens to be a very bourgeois type community that mirrors everything that's happening in society. And then the stuff that they have against me is how come this guy who came out of nowhere, who was so poor, working in the, in the farm, working in the factory, how did he get to be a professor, writing books, teaching, well known all over the world? We gotta do something to take him out. You can't make these things up. Instead of people putting their arms around me like they did before, when, because a lot of folks helped me. I mean, a tremendous amount of people helped me. Frankly, I wouldn't be where I am today were it not for the help that I received from folks as I was coming up who realized that I had intelligence and I had intellectual ability. They put their arm around me. But the world has changed. Those people are no longer with us, unfortunately, and those that are now inhabitant of this world right now, especially those that I have interaction with every day, they can't stand me. Not because I'm arrogant, not because I do something wrong, not because I mistreat a patient, not because I do anything, but it's quite the contrary. Because I spend my entire day, seven days a week as I practice, fighting on behalf of patients. They can't stand that. They can't stand it when I fight for patients to get high quality care. That, turned me, that makes me into a bad person. Okay, so if you think I'm a bad person, just leave me alone, let me be. That's not gonna happen. They have to actively, using all kinds of incredible device that you never thought a human brain can think of to try to do harm to me personally and also professionally, just to take me out. For doing absolutely nothing, there's a jealousy, envy, that I've achieved more than they've achieved. It is clear that I have much more intelligence than they have. I have more credentials than they have. They can't stand it. If it were one of them that has the kind of, you can't make these things up. I mean, I have a hospital that I participated on every day now or for so many years, 38 years. I won't name the name of the hospital. Maybe about six, seven, eight years ago, some major organization chose me to choose certain doctors that I wanted to award I think pediatrician, neurologist, and attorneys. My job was to pick up out of the list. Now they don't know that I was the one doing the choosing. I was giving this great honor to do that. I sat at my little office, very nicely, very carefully, very ethically, professionally, did a great job. I chose that one, I chose this one, I chose that one among the list because I know these people, I know the quality of work they do. And of course, sure enough, um, unknown to these folks, this was all done anonymously, that I was the one doing the choosing. They had no business, they still don't know. These people, maybe about four or five or six different folks were chosen in different uh, subspecialties and specialties. Well, in the wall, as soon as that happened, in the lobby of this hospital, beautiful photographs of all these folks was put in and placarded all over the, uh, the, the lobby to praise them, which, they're entitled to, they earn it, but these folks did not know who chose them. I did, that's none of the business. To this day, they don't know. Well, it so happened that I went to Washington, D.C. to be in doctors as an MACP, which is the highest rank any physician in the world can achieve. Where was my photograph? My photograph was never in the lobby. <laughs> my picture was never in the lobby. I mean, I mean, you can only laugh at stuff like that. You know what I mean? Here it is, I finished doing all this for these people, doing all the choosing, doing all this other stuff. Now it was my turn now for somebody to choose me. Well, I was chosen. I was chosen. I became an MACP. 
my own institutions that I've given so much time to wouldn't even acknowledge me. Wouldn't. In fact, quite the contrary. The story got to be so ugly, I wouldn't dare describe it to you on television. Because when I was called and asked whether or not what transpired, well, the reverse happened. All sorts of things were done. I mean, you have no idea how ugly, how evil, how vicious what was done to try to, in fact, determine whether or not it was true that I, in fact, was elected as an MACP, which I was. Well, you wouldn't believe this. I, I got that information way later. The first people who got the information were the people that I made a terrible mistake, and I'll live to regret it, by sending a copy of my fantastic letter that I received to Montefiore, I sent it to Einstein, I sent it to the hospital on Post Road here, I won't name the name of the hospital, which was fine. I mean, I was supposed to get another letter in six months to describe to me, please allow me to do this, because you, you have to understand what evilness is, to describe to me what it is that was going to happen, the whole process. It was a long, incredible process. They have to measure your head, they have to give you a cap, you got to find your gun, you got to... All this incredible thing, what hotel you were going to talk to, the whole nine yards. Well, that hospital on East Post Road called the college. Called the college. You can't make the first of all to verify that it was two that I was <laughs> elected as an MACP. The next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call from that administration telling me everything that's going to happen six months from now. Okay. No big deal. The rest is so ugly, I can't tell it to you. You can figure it out. So it wasn't for a good reason that the college in Philadelphia was called to find out if it was true or not that I got a letter. A letter was signed. I gave him a copy of it. It was from the ugliest, most evil, vicious thing you could think of. So two weeks before I was supposed to go to Washington, D.C. to be inducted, I, I won't even tell you what happened, but I survived everything. So I went ahead and came back and did my thing in Washington, D.C. with my kids. As I'm sitting here, I'm still waiting for a phone call from that administration to congratulate me. That is 2008. How many years is now? We are now, that's eight years later. I'm still waiting for a phone call to congratulate me. I just wanted to give you an idea. And this is a hospital who was a very good hospital, excellent hospital, but they into incredible public relations. And one of the staff member, hospital was created in, in the 1800s, the first time in its history they have a physician who is holding two full professorships to treat patients every day, who has a mastership in his pocket, and then every single day, seven days a week, I'm treated like you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it, okay? So I just want you to know that you got bad, fo bad folks out there. I couldn't care less because I have a TV show and I'm not saying anything negative. I'm, I'm just sharing with you some of my experience that I'm dealing with every day, okay? Every day, they put people in charge of, of me who are not smart enough to carry this book for me, and yet they're in charge, okay? You can't make these things up. So getting back then to hypertension and its effects on the brain and stress, on the, well, stress is terrible. And black folks like me suffer from stress more than anyone else because of all the people in the world that are the most hated in America, the black man in particular is hated the most. The reason I happen to know it but I won't tell it to you. Not because a black man has done anything illegal or immoral. The rest, you could figure it out. It's been going on since the time of slavery. And I know it very well because I'm a researcher. I wouldn't dare say it on TV, but I think I may have mentioned it somewhere in some book. And if I haven't, I guarantee you, before I die, I will. Okay, so, so stress is bad. So you have to be able to cope with it. Because otherwise, it affects your brain because it affects your blood pressure, causing the blood pressure to go up. Yes, the more stress you are under, the more adrenaline you are secreting, the more adrenaline you secrete, 
the higher your pulse rate, the higher your uh, blood pressure, and of course, you wind up with stroke. I have 35-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old black men and women in my practice over the years who have stroke for no reason, not any congenital problem because of stress, poverty, and the torture they're going through every day. It's not physical torture with somebody beating you, but they're doing stuff to you that is so ugly, so evil, so vicious, that you have to be strong to handle it. But I am strong, and I have handled it, okay? So the brain then has to be evaluated by doing the physical exam for the brain, the neurological exam. You may, may not need the help of a neurologist to help you to make the proper diagnosis. And then you proceed to do the best test available to evaluate the brain, of course, is an MRI. In particular, if you do it with, a, uh, with contrast, it evaluate the entire brain for you. Also, when you're talking about the brain, you must also remember the carotid arteries. That's the artery that carries blood from either side, of the brain, uh, either side here to the brain. They can also develop plaques, and they often do. Because if they're occluded, you can also have a stroke because of that. And then the next question is, what do you do to prevent the stroke? Well, you control the blood pressure. You try to take a baby aspirin every day if you're not, um, if you're not contraindicated to it. You've got to be very careful. You just don't go and take aspirin on your own. Your physician has to clear you for that because there are many un underlying conditions such as Van Willebrand disease, which is the most common bleeding abnormality in the world, and you can't have Van Willebrand and take aspirin, so it's up to you and your doctor to figure out if you have it or not. There are ways of telling. 25% of folks who develop hemophilia A do so spontaneously during lifetime. Those things you have to know about so you don't start popping aspirin. And if you could have an ulcer, and if you have symptom of it, you have to be cleared by your physician before you could take aspirin because aspirin is a fantastic, fantastic medication. I take a baby aspirin myself every morning, and it's very, very important. It decreases not only the incidence of heart problems, stroke, and also colon cancer, etc. It's a beautiful article in the Annal of Internal Medicine this week that describes all the conditions that are associated with ingestion of aspirin, and it is all positive. You ought to take a look at it. It's on the, it's on the internet. The whole chapter, there's a task force, task force that tell you the truth about what aspirin does, why it prevents colon uh, cancer, why it prevents the heart problem, why it prevents the stroke, etc. Aspirin is just, as far as I'm concerned, the singular most important medication ever created, period. So now that you do that, then of course you do the best you can try to eat a diet that is less rich and simple carbohydrate. Complex carbohydrates are fine. Simple carbohydrates are all bad. And they all, everything that's contain is, is simple sugar is bad. Everything that's contain complex carbohydrates is a pasta, brown bread. There's a chapter on obesity in this book that lists all the good, good food all the bad food, all the food that are simple carb, all the food, that it's all, and it, I believe it's chapter four in this book, The Heart and Practice of Modern Clinical Medicine that I wrote that just came out a few months ago. That's one of the reasons why they hit my guts with a passion because I wrote this book, 136 chapters, all by myself. I didn't, help the, I didn't have to ask them for permission to write it, and I write it by myself, and they can't stand that. If they don't like me, why don't you go they don't like it. Write their own book. The books are there to be written. If they have the brain, the ability, they know how they think they can do it. Let them go ahead and do it. They can't shut me up because I'm going to continue to talk. I'm going to continue to write books. I'm going to continue to teach. Nothing. They didn't put me in this world. God did. Only God can take me out. That's about all. If they do anything funny physically, they'll go to jail for sure because we only really know who they are. My kids know. My grandkids know. We're watching. So. And then, of course, the neurology is very important. If they're having symptom of transient ischemic attack, there's a fantastic, fantastic medication out there named Agonox, which is a combination of vasodilator and a very small amount of aspirin, I think 50 
a 25 milligram of aspirin, something like that. You take it twice a day for a total of 50 milligrams of aspirin. It's fantastic. It's open the vessel, and it also, you understand, too much aspirin is bad for you. Less aspirin is better for you. You have to understand that. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. The more aspirin you take, the more dangerous it is for you. The less aspirin you take, the more safe it is for you. Okay, and I'm not going to get into the detail of that, but that's the reality. Don't 325 milligram of aspirin for what? What are you taking it for? When 81 milligram can do just as well. It doesn't do one thing better for you if you take one 325. That can hurt you more than if you take 81, or for that matter, 50. They don't make it 50. So they make 81, so take the 81. It, it does the job even better with less side effect than the 81. So the brain is crucial. You know that very well. If the blood pressure is not controlled, let's say you don't have stroke, you may wind up with what's called dementia. The dementia is secondary to microvascular disease of the brain. The vast majority of black folks in this country who develop dementia have it because they have blood pressure that was not treated at all or get treatment too late or being treated with the improper medication. So they wind up with microvascular disease of the brain, and the part of the brain that deals with memory is got affected with lack of blood flow and oxygen, they develop dementia. They don't have Alzheimer's. They may behave ultimately like if they have Alzheimer's, but in reality, they don't have Alzheimer's as we know it. About six million folks have Alzheimer's. You have 76 million folks with hypertension, and the vast majority of less than 30% are being treated properly. So you can understand the incidence of dementia, secondary to post poorly treated blood pressure, is much higher than the, the Alzheimer's, as we know it. Listen, next week, I'll be going to talk about the effect of hypertension on the heart. Until such time, keep watching this show. This is Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye-bye.